and we will stand forgiven. This is my favorite line of that. We will stand forgiven. The reason it's my favorite line is because it's past tense. Is because it says the work is done. And so often when we come to God with our sin and we're struggling with it, we're struggling with the guilt, we'll do all the things and we'll ask for all the forgiveness and we'll still walk out of the prayer still feeling like we're carrying it, still feeling like we've got work to do and penance to do. And the scripture is very clear. You do not. The work has been done once for all, the scripture says, specifically in Hebrews. Jesus died once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Amen? Amen. That means it's done. That means I stand here forgiven and clean before God with a clean slate. Praise God. Praise God. So we're going to start talking about Solomon because we're in the book of Proverbs. So if you would, go to your Bibles. Um, however you've got your Bible today, whether it's a physical Bible or a, a phone, uh, open the app. It's also going to be on your screens. We're reading about King Solomon because we're in the book of Proverbs today. And we've been in the book of Proverbs for three weeks so far. This is week four. And I could go about another 40 weeks in the book of Proverbs because it's so direct and practical. And I'm learning so much. It's so helpful for me. There are people even in this church, one of our elders, they, they, they read um, Proverbs every single day. They'll read a chapter in Proverbs every single day because the book of Proverbs has 31 chapters. And so it's very convenient if you're in a month that has 31 days. Amen. And so you can just, whatever day you're on, you can just read the proverb for that day and just keep going and just make this introduction of wisdom into your life because King Solomon has got so much good stuff to say to us. Um, so I want you to understand King Solomon, who, who wrote most of the book of Proverbs, not all of it, but most, one of the wisest people that ever lived. We're going to look at his history. Pastor Ricky read it a little bit on week one. I want to go back to it because there's a little detail there that I think is so important for, for today. Because today's topic is how to be teachable. How to hear advice and not get defensive. And not get prideful. Anybody need that today? A couple of us. So 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 5. Look at this. It says, That night the Lord appeared to Solomon. This is when he's brand new as a king. God goes and visits him in a dream. And God said, What do you want? Ask and I will give it to you. This is in 900 BC, quite a long time ago. And God goes to him and says, What do you want? It's almost like wish fulfillment, right? It almost sounds like a legend or sounds like an old children's story, but this one's real and it happened in time and space. God asked Solomon and it was a test for him. Verse seven, now, O Lord, my God, this is Solomon talking. You have made me king instead of my father, David, but I am like a little child who doesn't know his way around. Now, take this in for a second. It's King Solomon. He's in charge. He's a wealthy guy. He's supposed to know what's up. And what does he say to God? I feel like a little child. Have you ever been given responsibility and didn't feel like you could measure up to the responsibility you've been given? And often when we feel that way, when we feel like there's a big difference and I'm not quite qualified to do the thing that God has given me to do, what do we often do in our humanity? We fake it, right? We fake it, we pretend. Hollywood tells us, don't let them see a sweat. Right, like that's the route that we tend to go. Not Solomon. Solomon is owning his humanity and he's owning his weakness here. We've got to understand that the beginning of wisdom is to own where you're weak and to ask God for help. Amen. Verse 8. And here I am in the midst of your own chosen people, Solomon says, a nation so great and numerous they cannot be counted. Give me an understanding heart so that I can govern your people well and know the difference between right and wrong. For who by himself is able to govern this great people of yours? So number one, Solomon is humble. I am like a little child. And number two, Solomon is unselfish. He's loving. He says, God, what's striking me right now is this group of people that you've given to me. Number one, they're your people. He calls them God's people. So he's not possessing them. He realizes he's a steward, like a lot of good leaders throughout the scripture realize that they were just stewards. They were just under shepherds. They were taking care of God's people based on a calling. They didn't possess his people. You don't belong to me. I'm here to take care of you, my responsibility. 
But he says, I want to take care of them, God. You hear the unselfishness there? It's not, it's, not about, it's not about his influence. It's not about his legacy in the world. It's about him taking care of God's people. And I love that about him. Verse 10, the Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for wisdom. And so God replied, because you have asked for wisdom in governing my people with justice and have not asked for a long life or wealth or the death of your enemies, I will give you what you asked for. I will give you a wise and understanding heart such as no one else has, has ever had or ever will have. It's why Christians see Solomon as the wisest person outside of Jesus who ever lived. And I say outside of Jesus because that's a whole other topic, but Jesus is the source of wisdom. Jesus is wisdom itself incarnate. John chapter 1 tells us that. But I love God goes to him and says, I gave you the wish what you normally would have asked for, what most people would have asked for, was number one, a whole lot of money, amen? And the death of my enemies, and a really long life to enjoy it all. If we're real, many of us, if God had given us this opportunity like this, there would be some dead bodies around us. We don't like to talk about this very often, but there are some people who are currently in your way. They're just in the way. God, I, I just, I'd like you to deal with those people, please. Right? And then give me some money. So I can fix all the problems that I want to fix with money and then give me a long life to enjoy it. He doesn't say, he doesn't say any of that stuff. And God is so encouraged. So God gives him the wisdom. And then verse 13, God goes further. And I will also give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will be compared to you for the rest of your life. And so God comes and says, because you answered well and you just wanted wisdom, humility and unselfishness, I'm going to give you the rest of the stuff that you didn't ask for as well. And some of you, if you know the Bible, you know the New Testament, you're hearing this little pre-echo in your mind that if you would seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these other things that you're worried about will be added to you as well. Jesus said that in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, you're worried about clothes. You're worried about money. You're worried about food. You're worried about all these things. What, how are you going to make ends meet? You're worried about all of that stuff, but seek first the kingdom of God. And then God brings all the blessings after it. If you get your priorities right, it opens the door. So that's how Solomon got his wisdom. Then the question becomes, how do we get our wisdom? I'd say the way that we get our wisdom is we get it from other people by listening to them, right? So take the hot stove, for instance. There's two ways to approach the hot stove. You can let somebody tell you, hey, don't put your hand on the hot stove, right? And there's a wisdom to that because it doesn't involve a hospital bed, amen. Or you can put your hand on the hot stove and you can also learn that way. In both cases, you learned, and some of us, we've got to touch every hot stove that's brought in front of us. And the scripture comes to us and says, hey, don't, do, don't let consequences be your teacher. Let a person be your teacher. Let God bring counselors around you to tell you how to do this. Timothy Keller, uh, pastor, he's actually struggling with uh, stage four pancreatic cancer right now. Tim Keller said, a discerning person learns from a single rebuke what others must suffer devastating losses to understand. Proverbs 15, 31. If you listen to constructive criticism, you will be at home among the wise. If you reject discipline, you only harm yourself. But if you listen to correction, you grow in understanding. Do you see what it's saying here? It says you ought to be able to be criticized. You ought to be able to be corrected. You ought to be able to be disciplined. And those things are the path to becoming a more and more wise person. Like that absolutely blows our minds in our current culture, doesn't it? Like we don't see that as the path of wisdom. We would like to show up to the conversation and already be good to go. We'd like to already be wise and there'd be no need for this. But what God envisions is that the wise person is the one who is teachable all along, no matter how old you are. Oh boy. Because let's be real too, it's as we get older, often don't we get less teachable? You're like, not me, Pastor. And probably not, probably not. 
It's like every step of the way, as people start to respect us more, we get a few things right here and there. We, we want to jump into this place of like, I'm the wise one now. And that's not the view of Scripture. The view of Scripture is that you're a lifelong learner who is open to the wisdom that anyone would bring to you. There was a, there was a time... Um, we had a preaching team back at my church in Illinois, and, and what that means is on Tuesday mornings, every Tuesday morning, we would plan out the messages and plan out the uh, series that were coming up. But we would also, the very first part, and you never miss this part, is you would get feedback on the sermon that you gave the past Sunday. And as you can imagine, that's a dicey time, right? Like, like you're actually going to criticize me and the way that I presented the message, you know? It's like, no, 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 I'm just led by the Holy Spirit. You don't get to tell me anything that I'm doing is wrong. No, that's not real. It's like you submit yourself to a healthy feedback loop. Why? Because the privilege and the responsibility to bring the words of Jesus to a group of people, it's just too great. Your pride, there's no room for your pride. I mean, mine still wiggles in there for sure. But there should be no room given to it and if there's a way to better share the words of Jesus, shouldn't we hear that way? Especially the more souls that are on the line? Of course we should. And so we had that principle. It's like, if you're going to preach, you have to submit yourself to feedback, and people are going to give you feedback. And I remember there was this guy, a very close friend of mine, Jason Morris, one of the other pastors, and he said to me this one time, he said, Josh, whenever you share a joke, he said, what I'm noticing is you will introduce a pregnant pause You'll say the joke, and then you'll wait for people to laugh. And he's like, and not only will you do that, he's like, but if they don't, things get uncomfortable. And, and he's like, and two, there's a little bit of a feeling that you as a speaker up there, you're a little bit of a needy person. Oh, I just wanted to smack him. <laughs> How dare he say that to me? That's not true at all until I talked to Linda and she said, yeah, it's true. <laughs> but it's tough, isn't it? Because what do I want? I want to be the perfect preacher already. I don't want anything to be wrong. I want to, I want to slowly discover what everybody ought to know about how great I am. And I want to, I want to write the next bestseller about how everybody ought to preach like me right, and be a dad like me, and be a husband like me, and manage money like me. I want to just be awesome. I don't want to discover that there's things I need to work on. Not fun, but so good. Can, and I'm still working on that, by the way, can people tell you the truth? Can they come to you face to face? And can they give advice? Can they give correction? Can they give discipline into your life and tell you the truth about you? And do you welcome it? Are you glad about it? And maybe not as your initial reaction, but can you get there and say, wow, this is a day that I'm going to grow. So <clears throat> here's what I want to do. For, for the next little section here, I want to do an assessment, and it's going to be a self-assessment. But I'm going to give you five symptoms of an unteachable spirit. And I want you to like dig into this and say, God, and be prayerful in your seats there. God, do I have an unteachable spirit? And we're just going to explore this and see what the Holy Spirit says to you. So the very first symptom of an unteachable spirit is that you would be defensive in your nature. Do you feel threatened when people give you advice? When they tell you that you're doing something wrong, do you in response lay out your legal case argument by argument? For why, nope, you're right instead. Do you do that? Do you make excuses for why they don't understand your unique way of doing things? Proverbs 12, 15 says, fools think their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. The whole thing about thinking our way is right, that's humanity, amen? We've got to learn, learn to listen. Here's what I'd suggest Maybe make a rule like this for yourself. Just practical. What if you had a rule for yourself that says, I won't be defensive no matter what kind of advice or correction is brought to me. And let's be real, I'll make this disclaimer for the entire message. Sometimes the advice that's brought to you is wrong, amen? 
Sometimes they're wrong. That's absolutely true. But here's the thing. If you're defensive about it every single time, you won't hear it even when it's right. Because you'll cast it aside like I often do. Instead, could you build a pattern into your life and say, you know what? Every time somebody brings this to me, I'm going to go quiet. And I'm going to listen. And I'm going to let their words stand in the conversation. And I'm going to say, here's a great thing to say. I'm going to go pray about that. I'm going to go give it a couple of days. Don't go to the arguments. But what would happen in our marriages if we could do this? Oh, my. I'm just going to listen. I'm just going to let this ferment in my mind, in my heart. I'm going to see what the Holy Spirit confirms or doesn't confirm. But I'm not going to allow myself to counter arguments right now. So the very first way is to just listen. Um, There was a guy named Frank Cook, and he was kind of the Obi-Wan Kenobi, um, amazing guy of church ministry back in Illinois. He just knew everything. And Frank was old and all white hair, and and there's something about the white hair, you know what I mean? You just respect it immediately, some of us do. And he just knew everything. He was so wise and so loving, just, just a caring guy. And I remember, and I've told this story here before, but I just need to illustrate this point. Um, there was a person who wrote us a letter and said that they were leaving the church and they were super mad. And they were super mad at me specifically. And the reason they were mad is because it had been their birthday on a Sunday and I had not wished them happy birthday from the stage on a Sunday. And that was very odd because we did not w- wish everybody happy birthday on their birthday on a Sunday morning. And some of you have been in churches where they did that and I honestly, I think that's what, the, what this person had come from. They had come from a church that had done that. But they were just deeply, deeply offended. And it was this big, angry letter that I got back from them. And I was just so confused. And I was a young pastor. And oh my gosh, what did I do? And, and, and what, what, what do I think about all of this? And I took it to Frank because Frank knew everything. And Frank looked at it and he said, hey, you didn't do anything wrong. And this is fine. But he gave me this tidbit of, uh, of gold here. He said, sometimes... What was done was about this big, but a person's reaction is about this big. And he said, when there's a difference between the thing done and just that massive reaction from somebody, he said, your conclusion should be there's something deep in this person's past. There's a source of bitterness and pain and fear that's there that you can't see. And they might not even know that it's there. So walk tenderly, walk patiently because it's this massive thing. And I just, it was such a great thing to learn. Help me understand ministry in a lot of ways um, for other people. I'll just say for other people, right? See where this might be going. So this last Christmas, I was with my family. And um, I was with my mom, with my sisters. And we had this moment. And Christmas can get stressful at certain family parties. Yes? Um, and it was just one of those stressful moments. And I remember in the midst of it, um, one of them did a thing, and I'm not going to go into detail, but one of them did a thing, and my response was massive. And I don't mean I was screaming, because I'm not a screamer. But they grew up with me, and they know what a big Josh Trueblood reaction actually looks like. And they saw me in the moment and they knew what was going on. And it was just this like, what's happening right now? And at the time, I could legally defend exactly how I got where I got. But I got into the car and we were driving and the Lord started to work on me. You know where he took me? He took me right to Frank's words and said, sometimes a little thing happens, and that's all they did. They just did this little thing. And you took this little misdemeanor, and you, you made it like, you know, capital punishment, basically. It was like the words of Frank came back to correct me. Can the words come back to correct you? We need to have open hearts. Next one is laziness. Here's the next symptom, laziness. 26, Proverbs 26, 16. Lazy people consider themselves smarter than seven wise counselors. Now, you might be surprised that laziness made the list. The reason it made the list, see what Proverbs is saying? Laziness can lead to foolishness. Why can laziness lead to foolishness? Because if someone corrects you, it takes work to change. And sometimes we're in a place of ignorance where we don't know what wisdom is. And for us to get wisdom would take work, i.e. read a book. 
Some of you guys have got a, a, a marriage that's in a bad place, but you've not even tried to find a book that you could read to learn about how to have better conflict, how to have better communication, how to reignite romance. You've, you've not even done research about it or, or you're broken with your family over politics and you're unwilling to read and to research and to come to a more balanced place. Laziness sometimes is the thing that gets in the way. Some, sometimes somebody says, no, I'm not going to go to a counselor because that's going to cost money. No, that's going to take time. I've got to schedule something. And they said that they're currently a month out and that stops us. Don't be lazy about getting wisdom. Next one, pride. Proverbs 18.2, I love this. Fools have no interest in understanding. They only want to air their own opinions. <laughs> How many conversations have you been in and, and you could just tell in the first five minutes, all they want to do is tell me what they think about life. All they want to do is like express what they think. They don't want to get anything back. And you can kind of feel that in a conversation with people sometimes. Um, I think... What I do sometimes is I'll be in a conversation with somebody and they'll give me a piece of wisdom. And immediately I feel the tension. I'm not going to admit to this person that they just taught me something. So what I'll do is I will reform the same statements back to them in my own words. You mean this, right? And you know what I'm not saying to them when I, when I do that sneaky little thing? I'm basically trying to imply to them, yeah, I already knew that already. Because that's pride. I knew that already. Do we feel that? Right, come on. I knew that already. Like, I've got this dark little dream, and I am the best ever. And my dark little dream, when anybody gives me advice, it shatters it just a little bit. And that's not a fun day. And so in order to protect my dream and to protect my pride and my view of myself, I have to reject your advice. Or the flip. Maybe every time God allows somebody to bring advice to me, it does shatter the idol that's in my life. And maybe Jesus starts to become Lord a little bit more and me a little bit less. Maybe that's part of what he's been after all along is a destruction of our pride. Yeah. Yeah. Isolation in tough times. Proverbs 18.1, whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Sometimes when our life breaks, we go into a cave and we go it alone. Sometimes when you get lost, you don't want to stop for directions. Just give me a little bit longer. I'll get us there. Right? Or it's, or it's your weekend warrior and you're trying to do the, the fix-it stuff at the house and it's like, this is my sixth trip to Ace Hardware today. Don't worry, honey, this is normal, right? <laughs> and what we're saying is just give me a little longer. I've got this. I'm capable of this. It's like, that's isolation. And we can do that in any area of our life. It's like, leave me alone. I'm good. Again, I've got my dark little dream over here. I'm going to figure this out. And if I figure it out on my own, I win. Getting help is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of wisdom. I had a um, doctor once who was in my church, great guy, and he was in the hospital, and I went to visit him as his pastor, and it was this, it was this weird kind of moment, because you're like, I'm visiting a doctor in the hospital, you know, and I remember walking into the room to see him, great guy, and he looked all sheepish, sheepish when I walked into the room, and um, and he's like, oh, you're here. And it's like, yeah, you know, usually people are happy about that, but whatever. And, um, and we started to talk, and, and he had hurt his finger. And not only had he hurt his finger, but it had gotten, like, super infected and really, really bad. And, and uh, he starts to tell me the story. And again, he's looking really sheepish about it, but he just decides to go ahead and confess. He said, sometimes doctors are the worst patients. He said, I, see, I, I had this issue come in, and he said, I started treating myself. I started getting my own medication and trying to treat my own problem. And it's the worst thing ever to have a doctor treating themselves. What you need is a pair of eyes outside of the situation that can look at it objectively and treat you. And he's like, that's what I should have done. And that's why he looked so sheepish and all that kind of stuff. But it's like sometimes we want to treat ourselves. 
Sometimes we isolate. Sometimes pastors like to treat their own problems instead of letting anybody else into their life. Sometimes parents do that. Sometimes business leaders do that. Amen? I think we all do that a bit. Next, chronically unhealthy, Proverbs 29.1. Whoever stubbornly refuses to accept criticism will suddenly be destroyed beyond recovery. Um, I think what this is talking about is sometimes you, you do so much ignoring of advice and help that would come to you that just as a symptom, if you could admit to yourself, you know what, my marriage has been in a bad place in this way, and it's just always been in a bad place, and I've never really sought help. Or my, my, my relationship with my kids has just always been bad. This, this addiction in my life has always been out of control. And you can go on and on and on about the different things. That it's just like, it's just been chronically unhealthy and it's never gotten better. And maybe, maybe the Holy Spirit is whispering in your ear this morning that the reason it's chronically unhealthy is because you've not sought counsel. And you could have because the answers were out there. Do you ever watch professional golf? Yeah, first service didn't either. Here's, here's what is great about professional golf. If, if you're in a mood to nap on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, you can put professional golf on, and then when you wake up from the nap, nap, it looks like it's in the same spot that it was when you went to sleep. And so you don't feel like you'd missed anything. It's a, it's a great feeling. But um, <laughs> the commentators, too, it's like they lull you to sleep. It's just the most brilliant thing ever. But here's, here's what I notice about professional golfers. Like, they're at the top of their game, right? They're super competitive. They're the best and, and, and wealthy and all this kind of stuff. But guess who's right next to them? It's not just the caddy. It's their coach. Whenever you look at them, they've always got that coach right next to them. It's the same thing with the Olympics, with the gymnasts. Their coach is right there. But many of us live our lives as if I cross a certain threshold of skill and wisdom, I shouldn't need coaches anymore. But that's not what they do. And that's not what Solomon is suggesting here. He's saying having a coach in your life and advisors in your life is not an indication that you haven't grown up yet. It's an indication that you're actually somebody who is constantly growing and wise. Welcome, constant advice. So four characteristics of a teachable spirit. So we looked at the symptoms of maybe you're not teachable. Let's look at what teachable actually is. We're going to go positive here. The very first thing is humility. Fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor. Now, fear of the Lord, if you've not been with us before, um, this is something we consistently explain. That word fear there does not mean scared kind of fear. What it means is it means awestruck. It means in awe of God. Like if you're standing in front of the, the Grand Canyon and you see the enormity and the beauty and the power of the whole thing, and you better not take too many steps forward or you're going to fall off the cliff. It's that kind of awestruck of this amazing thing. When you have that kind of view of God, that's why we sing worship, right? If you have that kind of view of God, you know what starts to happen? It teaches you wisdom. Why? Because he's the one who's wise and I'm not. The more I focus on him and I allow awe into my life and wonder into my life, the more I start to realize how dependent I am, how much I need him. And then the second part, and you, that kind of humility precedes honor. There was a, there was a guy at an inter-varsity Christian fellowship meeting in, at the University of Illinois and I went there, and he was this worship leader, and he was leading the night, and I'd never met him before, and he was just really amazing at his craft, and he's up there playing guitar and, and just kind of talking to us the whole night. It was this really interactive kind of worship uh, time that we had, and um, uh, he would play Elton John songs. It was really weird. I didn't realize Christians could play Elton John, John songs, but he did, and, and um, he was just kind of expressing his joy, right? It's like he saw the beauty in some of those songs, and he was expressing that, and um, so he he play those songs and he's talking about different things. And throughout the conversation, just this really weird stuff would happen. He would talk about the sin that he did that day. Like specifically, he would tell us what he had done and how the Holy Spirit had come and said, hey man, this sin is an issue. And then I confessed that to God. And he would just let that hang out there. And then be like, yeah, and then God spoke to me about this other thing I was doing and maybe it wasn't right. And you know, he'd start that way. Like maybe I made this mistake. He's like, now, nah, who am I fooling? It was sin. And he'd say that. It's like for, for 
like an old Baptist kid? It's like, that's weird, dude. We don't do that. Like, we don't talk about our sins like that. And it's like maybe at a revival meeting, you go up front and you're crying and stuff, and maybe you talk about your sin there once. But certainly not if you're a pastor up in front of me, do you talk openly about your failures and call them by that word, sin. That formed me spiritually when I saw him do that. That is one of the, it's one of the great moments that the Lord gave me to see in my spiritual past. Because what I understood for the first time was when that guy talked about it like that openly with the rest of us, he was destroying the power of sin in his life. Because what he was saying was, I won't hide it. I'll talk about it openly. I don't need to be a righteous person here today because there's only one righteous person. We worship him. He's the deal, not us. That's, all, that's the way it's always been. But we get so stuck in this, this thing, even in the church, where it's like our pastors better be awesome and our pastors better be holy. That's not the New Testament. It's not. And he came and was able to see that. And when we hide our sin, do you know what happens? We give sin power. We give it power over us. We give it power over other people. And he destroyed it. And I just love that about him. That was a humility that for the rest of my life, I will never get over. That man was not stuck. And I don't want to be stuck. Next, welcoming correction. Proverbs 9, 8 says, so don't bother correcting mockers. They will only hate you. <laughs> but correct the wise and they will love you. Somebody who's in a place, they don't want to be corrected. You see what he's saying, but be in a place. Be in a place where he doesn't just say you accept correction. He says you love it. <sighs> yeah. Well, the thing I think is so interesting about correction is we're going to talk about seeking wise counsel here in a minute. But... Seeking wise counsel is when you proactively wake up one day and say, I'm strong enough to go get counsel from somebody who might not agree with me. And that's good. But receiving correction is a whole other thing. Because correction usually comes at you, and you didn't expect it. And you weren't prepared for it. And you didn't necessarily invite that person in, like Jason Morris telling me about my issues. But when it comes, how will you react? That's a true test of whether or not you're teachable today. Proverbs 27, 17 says, this, iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I love that verse, right? Because why? It's such a violent verse. Do you see the violence in it? As iron sharpens iron. Do you see the sparks? Because that's what it would be. For metal to sharpen metal, for a brother to sharpen another brother. There's violence there. There's disagreement there's discussion, right? Maybe hurt feelings for a few days and then they come back together and now they're wiser as a result. There's some things that you don't see here, brother. Maybe you see a whole lot in your life, but you don't see it all. God gave me a few gifts in order to give to you. And as we sharpen each other, we get sharper. And I love the idea in the scripture that you're not sharp enough yet. I don't care how old you are. You're not sharp enough yet. So keep being sharpened. And how? By other people. They've got things for you. Will you let it in or not? I think this is about listening. I think this is about listening and being open. I think our old people need to listen to the young. I think they have things to give. And I think our young need to listen to the old. I think men need to listen to women. I got a really loud amen for service for that one. <laughs> but I think women need to listen to men. I think black need to listen to white in the church. And I think white need to listen to black. I think we need to listen to each other. We need to sit down and we need to have the hard conversations where we don't necessarily agree. We need to let the disagreements come out and we need to sharpen each other and let the sparks fly a little bit and grow as a result because I think we're better when we let that process happen in that way. I think Republicans need to listen to Democrats. I think Democrats need to listen to Republicans. 
I think pro-lifers need to listen to pro-choicers. And I think pro-choicers need to listen to pro-lifers. So I don't know if you've been under a rock, but this last week some things happened. And um, Supreme Court overturned the case, uh, Roe versus Wade. And I'm not going to tell you how to feel about that today. I'm not going to try to tell you how to feel about that. We were talking about this morning in prayer. Um, There's some tension. Um, I don't remember this much tension except at the last election, the weekend after the last election. This was a pretty tense church to walk into. And there was tension. And some, some had a lot of joy. And some had fear and confusion and frustration at the last election. And I would say this morning, some of you were in a place of joy, and some of you were in a place of fear and frustration and confusion. And that's where you are. I'm not going to tell you how to feel. What I would say to us is, let's be family. Let's be a family of people who Jesus is so transcendent and we're so in love with him that we have him in common, even if we have nothing else in common. That's what I would say to us. I believe this is a time for seeking the Lord. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 7, if you're a note taker. And even if you haven't been taking notes, you might want to write that one down. You might want to read that one on your own. I'm not going to put it on the screen. But in that verse, Paul makes it clear that it's more important to be family than it is to be right. Say it again. It's more important to be family than it is to be right. And there's a principle there. And there's a principle that our our wider culture does not get. But if we come together in a church, family should matter. And family doesn't always agree, but family should always love. So I would say be wise with your words and be wise with your silence. I think, okay, I'm going to take the preaching hat off. And officially, you don't have to listen to me right now at all. I'll just give you some advice. I think this season that we're in is a time for silence. And I think it's a time for quiet prayer. I think back to the last election, some of us broadcast some things that six months later we looked back on and kind of like a bad tattoo and wish we hadn't said it, wish we hadn't done it. I think it's a time for patience and for silence. And I think after a season, there may be some good moments for some of our pro-life brothers and sisters in this church to sit down with pro-choice brothers and sisters and then learn from each other and say everything that Scripture says about iron sharpening iron, we're going to learn from each other. And some of you are like, oh, you mean I've got to agree with them. Nope, I don't mean that. You, you will likely come out still disagreeing but you might learn a few nuances from each other, a few principles that you didn't know before. Sit down with each other, prioritize family, and now that I've offended everybody in the room and online, (laughs) let's move on. (laughs) Next, submitting to authority. Proverbs 1, 8 through 9. My child, listen when your father corrects you. Don't neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. He just says, listen to mom and dad there. But I'm going to draw the wider principle because it's all over the scripture. Listen to authority, any kind of authority that God has placed in your life. Why? Number one, God puts people in your life who are responsible to care for you. Just like Solomon was responsible to care for the Israelite people. There are people like your parents God put in your life, like your coaches, like your teachers, like your pastors, like your life group leaders. God put them in your life and said, you're supposed to care for them. And then out of that responsibility... Sometimes God will speak wisdom through that person to you. And you need to listen to them more clearly than you listen to others. They aren't the same voice on the same level. God will sometimes speak things through your parents, and your parents are shocked that the words came out of their own mouths afterward. 
Any parents had that experience before? Yeah, you do that, and you're like, why in the world did that happen? Do you know what the answer is? is The answer is the Holy Spirit believes in this principle, and so he sends something miraculously through you to your kids, and that happens. And so listen to those who God has placed in authority over you, and I know it's complicated, but just don't wait for them to deserve your respect. Don't do that. Let them speak, give their words extra weight, and then finally seeking wise counsel. This is proactive, Proverbs 24, 6. So don't go to war without wise guidance. Victory depends on having many advisors. Now, I'm just reading you one. There's about four different times this gets said in the book of Proverbs in slightly different ways, but it's always all essentially the same thing. You need wise counsel. You need a multitude of counsel. You need many advisors. You need a team of counselors. That's what the scripture says. Wise counsel, you go after it. This is proactively, I go after it. Especially when the decisions facing me or the issues that are facing me are really big issues, I'm gonna go after wise counsel. So Linda and I do this. We've got, we've got a whole team and it takes a while. If you haven't built that team yet, it's gonna take a while to build that team. And you don't rush it. You don't, you don't just go to anybody. You go to people who love Jesus, amen? You go to people who see the scripture the same way that you see it. And those are your advisors. And then you listen to them. And sometimes you go to four or five people, depending on how big the decision is. And it's like, when you go to four or five people, sometimes they don't all agree. Sometimes it's a slam dunk issue, right? And they're all like, oh yeah, this is exactly what you need to do. But those are few and far between. More often for us in our experience, you go to these different people and they all, they all sort of somewhat agree. Maybe three or four say a similar thing and the other two don't. But guess what? The other two that don't agree with the first three, you still learn some great things from them because they got nuances and they got perspective. And some of them have the exact same life experience you do and others don't. Some of them just see the big picture and the broader principles. But all that stuff teaches you and gives you a better perspective on the whole thing. Bring a multitude of counselors into your life for us, it's Kirk and Barb Bodie. It's Bob and Harriet C. It's the church elders here at Grace, our counselors to us. It's Ricky and Rachel Bustos, our counselors to us. It is my pastoral counselor who I see who's been a pastor before and has a unique perspective that he gives to me. It's Dave and Heather Steinbeck. They're powerful for us. That's our multitude of counselors. I want to end with this. There was a guy named Jim Ranella when I was in college and he tried to give me advice and counsel once and I couldn't hear him. And I rejected what he told me. And I just wanna be honest with you. I've got plenty of these experiences in my life where God tried to speak something that I needed to hear and I couldn't hear it. And some of you guys are in that place right now. You couldn't hear it. And Jesus forgives us, amen? Jesus forgives us and he gives us a clean slate and a clean start. But this guy, Jim, came to me and, and I was a Bible study leader inside of his ministry. And so he wasn't just coming to me as a brother. He was also coming to me as a leader. And he said, Josh, you've gotten to a place where you've got a critical spirit toward other people. You've become judgmental. And I said, Jim, you're wrong. And I walked away. And Linda and I were in this place, and I'm going to drag Linda into this just a little bit. It was mostly my fault, though. But we were in this place where we had discovered some things about God that we hadn't seen before in our church history. We got so excited about it. We got so excited about some of these new blessings that we were receiving from the Lord. And we started to look at other people. We started to categorize people around us, the other Christians around us. And you guys have this blessing and you guys don't. And we started to see certain people as better than other people in, in the church. It was really gross. And we start, almost started trying to evangelize the ones who didn't see the, the doctrine the exact same way that we saw it. And we told ourselves, it's for their good. I'm trying to like give them something good, right? But we were just being jerks, really. It wasn't a way of grace. And again, I'm one of his leaders. It's like, he's got to call that out. I'm doing damage in his ministry. And he tells me, and I say, no, Jim, you're wrong. I don't have that kind of critical spirit. And he was a man of God. He was a good enough man of God that he kind of let me go. And it wasn't until about six months later that the Holy Spirit came in 
and finally got a hold of me. And if I could go back, man, you know what I'd say to Jim? I'd say, Jim, I don't know that I agree, but man, I'm just going to let your words stand and I'm going to take that before God and really try to be open. Or maybe I'm going to go to a multitude of counsel and I'm going to take your criticism of me and I'm going to take it to some other people and say, does this resonate with you? But I didn't do any of that. All I did was make my legal argument back to him and I defended myself. About six months later, the Holy Spirit came and showed me what I had done. And I think it took me maybe another year to write Jim an email. And we weren't even in the same town anymore. And I'm apologizing to him and saying, you were right all along. And I'm sorry for what I did. And He was so gracious. I cannot tell you how gracious this guy was. He just decided in that moment, you should have seen the email that I got back. He decided in that moment to be Jesus to me and to reflect the grace of Jesus back to me. And he held nothing against me and forgave me 100%. And can we say amen? amen. Isn't, that, isn't that good? Why don't you guys stand right now? See, some of us, we struggle with a teachable spirit. We struggle to be open. We want to know it all and we want to protect ourselves. And we don't want that little dream of us being awesome to die. And maybe that's been you. Maybe that's been you in general. Maybe it's been you just in a particular area that you struggle with. But regardless, just leave us with this word is that Jesus has forgiveness and a clean slate for us today. Let's pray. Lord God, you are always, always, always a savior. You're always the one who forgives us. You're always the one who gives us this favor and this treatment that we don't deserve. And God, we don't deserve that clean slate, God, but you offer it to us. And we thank you for that. And God, maybe we've ignored counsel in the past, God, but we're going to welcome it now. And we're going to do that by the power of your word. And Jesus, would you come and would you help us? And God, where things are broken, maybe because of our lack of teachability in the past, our stubbornness in the past, God, would you bring healing there? Lord, we all want healing, God. We love you, Lord. In Christ's name, amen.